Good morning, everyone. Father Gross here. Welcome to my mom's apartment and uh, top of the morning to you. We are here, so you need your grace and you need your Bible and open up to the Gospel of Luke chapter 13. We'll wait for folks to come on, so. Hope everyone's doing well today. Uh. Good morning. Hi, Pat. Hi, Carla. Yeah, drinking some coffee. Went to bed too late last night. The morning came very quickly. Hi, Kim. Hi, Janet. Hello, everyone. We'll start in a minute here. Yeah. Morning. Good morning. Okay, it's 6.15. Uh, welcome to our Lenten Bible study. Uh, my name is Father Bob Gross, and I hope all of you are doing well. Just a quick update for my situation right now. Um, here in Racine still, uh, there is a 50-50 chance today that uh, my mom will be going to a rehab facility we have not received final word from any of the facilities that we've requested to go to, uh, but it looks like my mom is getting to the place where she can leave the hospital, which I'm really happy about. But then she starts the next journey of starting rehab, which will be uh, quite a journey for her. So uh, I'm going to have this uh, Bible study with you. I'm going to have uh, mass, and then I'm going to head over to the hospital to see my mom and uh, we'll kind of see what the day holds in store for us. So, um, yeah, that's the status here. Continue to pray for me, my mom, and my family as we kind of navigate that and appreciate your prayers for all that. So that's kind of where things are. Um, just want to get her uh, get her settled in a, in a new place. So, yeah, so that's that. So how about we get to Chapter 13 of our Gospel then, okay? Gospel Luke, we can pray the the grace of um, the grace of um, Lent today. It's on the post too. Let's pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Abba, Father, Jesus, brother, and we praise you. We bless you. We love you. Please open our minds, hearts, and lives to the more you want to give us during this sacred season of Lent. Break down all the resistances in our hearts to going deeper with you, being more vulnerable with you, and living more generously for you. Lord, you are the only one who can save us from sin, death, evil, and sadness. Save us, help us, heal us. In this holy season where we remember all that Jesus did for us, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. 
Okay, chapter 13 of the Gospel of Luke. Here we go. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 13. Glory to you, O Lord. At, this, at, the time, at that time, some people who were present there told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with the blood of their sacrifices. He said to them in reply, Do you think that because these Galileans If you do not repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 people who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were more guilty than everyone else who lived in Jerusalem? By no means. But I tell you, if you do not repent, you will all perish as they did. And he told them this parable. There once was a person who had a fig tree planted in his orchard. And when he came in search of fruit on it, but found none, he said to the gardener, For three years now I have come in search of fruit on this fig tree, but have found none, so cut it down. Why should it exhaust the soil? He said to him in reply, Sir, leave it for this year also, and I shall cultivate the ground around it and fertilize it. It may bear fruit in the future. If not, you can cut it down. He was teaching in a synagogue on the Sabbath, and a woman was there who for 18 years had been crippled by a spirit. She was bent over completely, incapable of standing erect. When Jesus saw her, he called to her and said, Woman, you are set free of your infirmity. He laid his hands on her, and she at once stood up straight and glorified God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant that Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, said to the crowd in reply, There are six days when work should be done. Come on those days to be cured, not on the Sabbath day. The Lord said to him in reply, Hypocrites, does not each one of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his ass from the manger and lead it out for watering? This daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound for 18 years now, Ought she not to have been set free on the Sabbath day from this bondage? When he said this, all his adversaries were humiliated, and the whole crowd rejoiced at all the splendid deeds done by him. Then he said, What is the kingdom of God like? To what can I Fully grown, it became a large bush, and the birds of the sky dwelt in its branches. Again he said, To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of wheat flour until the whole batch of dough was leavened. He passed through towns and villages, teaching as he went and making his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? He answered them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, I tell you, will attempt to enter, but will not be strong enough. After the master of the house has arisen and locked the door, then will you stand outside knocking and saying, Lord, open the door for us. He will say to you in reply, I do not know where you are from. And you will say, We ate and drank in your company, and, and you taught in our streets. Then he will say to you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. And there will be wailing and grinding of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves cast out. And people will come from the east and the west and from the north and the south and will recline at the table, at table in the kingdom of God. For behold, some are last who will be first, and some who, who some first who will be last. At the same time, some Pharisees came to him and said, Go away, leave this area, because Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons, and I perform demon healings today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will accomplish my purpose. Yet I must continue on my way today, 
tomorrow and the following day. For it is impossible that a prophet should die outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How many a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were unwilling. Behold, your house will be abandoned. But I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 13, what do you all think? So, we... Uh, have to remember the context of this part of the gospel. Jesus is going to Jerusalem. He's on a walk. And on this walk are his disciples, the holy women who have been ministering to him, and his disciples, and um, the crowds that are really starting to join him. And uh, the crowds are getting bigger. Uh, so he's teaching them as he goes. And the first part of the gospel uh, chapter that we just read is the gospel we had on Sunday. Isn't that funny how it kind of coalesces? So it's the story of um, people bringing their concerns to Jesus, the first part. So at that, time, at that time, some people who were present told him about the Galileans whose blood had mingled with the blood of their sacrifices. So this shows something very clear right away, Pontius Pilate is an evil man, an evil man, a brutal man. Uh, think about what he did. He did a God-forsaken, sacrilegious, abominable thing in taking the blood of Galileans, taking their blood, and mixing it in with the sacrifices to pagan gods. I mean, can there be anything more insulting than that? To offer worship to a, a false god and mingle the blood of people with those sacrifices. It is a horrible, Shameful death those 18 Galileans went through. The Galileans. And then it is a sad and tragic death of the 18 people that died when a tower fell on them. And I don't know what Father um, Knipper preached about on Sunday, but there is this understanding in the first century Judaism that if something evil like that happened to you, it was because of your sins. You must have done something wrong that you deserve that type of death. It was a version of karma. Karma is a different thing, but it's there's some something similar that when bad things happen to you, it's because you probably deserve it. And what's Jesus' response? He dismisses that understanding. Do you think did that happened because of them, that it was because they were greater sinner than you? What does Jesus say? By no means. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Another very firm teaching of Jesus, that you better be close to God because you do not know what's going to happen this day. And it gives an understanding of why Jesus says, you do not know the day or the hour when the Son of Man comes. Right? Really, there's two senses of that. The one sense would be when he comes again in glory at the end of time. We do not know when, when Jesus is going to come. But also, we do not know the moment of our death. We do not know it. So you must be prepared. We must turn our lives over to God. We do not want to perish. 
It's another call to repentance, another version of a calling to repentance. Uh, during my trip here, uh, I've been reading a book by Brant Petrie. Unfortunately, I think I left it at a restaurant in Racine, and I don't know where the book is. But um, I was reading The Jewish Understanding of Repentance. And the Jewish understanding of repentance is twofold. And we have reduced it down to just one thing for many of our understanding of it. There's a twofold understanding of, of repentance. The first is turning away from our sins, rejecting our sins, being sorrow for our sins, which there is a moral quality to this. Your life is going a certain way, and you compare your life to what God is calling you to do, and you see a major gap in between those two. And you realize, I don't want that. I want to turn away from sin, right? We say it sometimes on Ash Wednesday. Turn away from sin and be faithful to the gospel. Right? So it's that first part, turning away from sin. I don't want sin to be a part of my life anymore. I reject sin. I'm going to struggle against sin. I'm going to not give in to it with the help of God. But the second aspect of repentance is turning towards God. Turning towards God. Peter Chrysologus, when we do acts of penance, make sure you do all three, prayer, fasting, almsgiving. Do all three, not just one. All three need to be done if you truly want to experience the fruit of repentance. Saying no to sin has to lead you to saying yes to God. Right? Saying no to sin leads you to saying yes to God. And then if you say yes to God and you turn towards God, fruit will bear fruit. The, the, there will be fruit bearing in you. Now you understand the parable of the fig tree. It's been hollow repentance on the account of the people of Israel. So the fig tree is Israel. The fig tree is Israel. That's been a symbol of Israel since the time of Moses. That the fig tree symbolizes Israel. And the parable is, we could probably look at a couple of it. it, it it's and seeing that the fig tree is not bearing any fruit. It's exhausting the soil. And says, I might as well just cut it down. Right? And then the gardener, the way I've been looking at it, the gardener is, um, the gardener is, I think, Jesus. Um, the gardener is Jesus. And the, the, the gardener says, Jesus, let me have it for one more year. Let me do a go and try at this thing. Let me get the manure out, the miracle grow out. Let me cultivate it. Let me see if I can get this fig tree to grow and to bear fruit. If it doesn't, then you can cut it down. So Israel was not producing the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of repentance, right? That's why it's really important for us. We have to be bearing fruit for the kingdom to show the fruit of our repentance, the fruit of the life of the Spirit in us. Our faith has to show something for it in our lives. That's what Jesus is saying. Now you understand the church's belief and our belief, faith and good works. There must be good works to show the fruit of your faith. You just can't believe and then just live like everybody else. The, the act of accepting Jesus into your life, of believing in him, and receiving his love, then in turn changes the way you think, the way you feel, and the way you act. And Jesus is saying that. Okay, he's moving down the road, and he goes to the Sabbath on Sunday, or Saturday, because the Sabbath is the holy day for Jews. And he sees a woman suffering, 18 years, completely bent over. 
and heals her on the Sabbath. And here you see the evidence of how Israel is not bearing fruit. The synagogue leader tells Jesus, do it on some other day. How asinine of a comment by that guy. Just asinine to say that. Hey, there's six days during the week. Come and be cured on that day, but not on the Sabbath. And again, it reminds Jesus, hey, why do we have the Sabbath? You don't get it, do you? Right? The Sabbath was a gift to us to be restored, to rest with God, to be with God, to learn from God. And what if God wants to bring wholeness to a person on that day? We're going to stop God because of some understanding of the commandment that we have? God is God. God wants to do what he wants. He's the one who brings the fullest meaning of what he's been commanding us to do, to honor the Sabbath day, right? It's God, it's God in that synagogue. Jesus is in that synagogue. This daughter of Satan, this daughter of Abraham was bound by Satan for 18 years. And you're telling me I'm going to wait one more day to set her free? What are you talking about? You know, that's what Jesus is saying. And look what happens again. People praise God because of his actions. Do you see? It's leading us back to praise of God, leading us back to relationship with God. This healing of this woman in the, in the synagogue was an act of reconciliation of that group of people being restored to their relationship with God. And it was through that woman. That woman walked away restored, and that affected every other single person in that synagogue. It didn't cause jealousy. It didn't cause, like, why did that happen to her and not to me? That's the worldly thinking. It allowed her to be a witness to God's power right here, right now. That's why God heals. So that we can approach the Lord with what our desires for healing. That's powerful. And then uh, Jesus starts with two parables to describe the kingdom of God, the mustard seed and the parable of the yeast. And... Um, I love it. God starts small, and then it then it expands. You know, think of a seed. A seed begins small. It grows over time, and then it becomes the great bush that the birds of the sky can find rest in. Gradually, right? Or yeast. When you're making a dough, you got to let the yeast set and let the yeast work. Sometimes you got to let it sit for 12 hours if you're doing a specialty bread, right? Slowly going at it. The kingdom of God is working even though you really can't see it, aren't really aware of it, right? It's only at certain moments of the process that you say, hey, boy, that dough is doubling in size. Hey, that, that, that plant's really starting to grow. Wow. It's starting to, that that's the kingdom of God in us. It's starting to take more and more part of our heart, right? It's crowding out the selfishness. It's crowding out the self-reliance and the control. It's just crowding it out because it wants to take over. God wants to gradually take over your heart, reign in beautiful. Isn't that a beautiful image? So that's why we always have to be seeking after God. And then look at, always seeking after God. Now look at the next part of the chapter. Someone asked him, Lord, will only be a few, few be saved? He answered, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I tell you, will attempt to enter, but will not be strong enough. Strive. Don't stop. Remember the parable of the sower, the different soils? 
God is just throwing that seed on people. What are you doing with your seed? What are you doing with your seed? Are you striving after God day in, day out? Because it's not enough to say, oh, I was with you, Lord. I saw you when you did this, or I saw you when I did that. Remember the family of Jesus, those who hear the word of God and act on it. Those are the ones who go to the kingdom of God. Those who hear the word of God and, and act. I think we're really getting a sense of what the word disciple means. It's to be disciplined. It's to follow after Jesus. After him. And um, if you do, you will be given the kingdom of God. And then um, after that comment, now we have Herod wanting to kill Jesus, right? Now what does Jesus, Jesus says, you go tell that fox what I'm doing. I cast out demons and I perform healings and nothing's going to stop me from going forward. I mean, he's up against Pilate. He's up against the Pharisees who want to kill them. He's up against Herod. I mean, the opposition, the storm is starting to be seen of what he's going to have to go through. And, and, and the question that I ask that I've always struggled with many times is, why do you want to do this to Jesus? All he's doing is good and you want to kill him. All he wants to do is good and you want to kill him. I get it. It's just mind-boggling to me why, why, why that is. And we'll see it as the defunct, dysfunctional relationships will start to show its ugly head when Jesus enters into his passion. Then lastly, he's coming towards Jerusalem and he looks at Jerusalem and he laments over it. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How many times I yearn to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were unwilling. Oh, Jerusalem, all I want to do is help you, and you reject me. That's God. That's God to all of us. All I want to do is help you, and you reject me so often. I'm like, oh, gosh. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I repent. I turn to you. Please help me. I mean, over Jerusalem. This shows how good his heart is. You know, it's beautiful. And here's the one thing uh, context got to know is that in this gospel, in the gospel of Luke, it is very clear what Jesus is prophesying here. He did, he did it a couple times a couple chapters ago. He is prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70 AD. Okay. Jerusalem is destroyed. 70, the Romans level it. And the children that are being born at this time, when Jesus is 33, you know, add 70, go, go to 70 AD. Within those children's lifetime, they're going to see everything that they ever hold dear in Jerusalem to be destroyed. And Jesus is saying, it didn't have to be like this. If you would have Acknowledge that I'm here for you, you know. Wow, just cutting to the heart scriptures today. The call to repentance, the fig tree, the curing of the woman in the, in the synagogue, the parable of the mustard seed and the yeast, the narrow gate, Herod's desire to kill Jesus, and then it ends with the lament of uh, Jerusalem. Um, powerful stuff. It's actually quite sobering. Um, it's quite sobering today, chapter 13. Um, 
So my encouragement to you is to read the chapter again. What sticks with you today? Here's my last um, encouragement that I'm going to try to take up to is draw close to God today. Draw close to him. Be with him. Be mindful of him. Heed his words. Live his words. Strive to enter through the narrow gate today. And may God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow morning, 6.15 in the morning. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a good day.